Hi everyone, um, I'm Stefan Spakers from PimVendors.com. Welcome to this Marketplace and Product Information Management Roundtable and very warm welcome to everyone here um, waiting for us to, uh, to kickstart on, uh, on the stage. Um, I'm Stefan Spakers, I'm a co-founder of PimVendors.com and I also sell on Marketplaces and co-founded a Marketplace. So I'm very curious what the different speakers have in, have in, um, have in mind for us and what we're going to discuss in just a few short minutes. Um, PIM Vendors, um, just to give you guys a quick introduction, if you don't know, um, we are a independent broker between customers and vendors. Uh, we help you select the best PIM independently, and we do that through independent content and independent advice. So if you have your need a PIM, or if you have any PIM product information management related questions, hop on over to our website, um, visit our content that we have there, um, fill in the tools that we have, including our quick scan, and that'll lead you to a independent short list of the best fitting um, top five product information management solutions. So um, today, as both a, a vendor and a, a uh, founder of a, a marketplace, I'm very curious what we um, are going to discuss. We have both speakers on the product information management solution side, um, but also um, from Miracle, one of the solutions that offers marketplace um, marketplace solutions for uh, for retailers. And um, before uh, we get into um, into all this, I would like to introduce you all to Lynn Davis. Um, he is the co-founder of um, retailinsider.com or uh, .co .uk, and um, also our moderator for today. Um, you are now all seeing our panel of guests, um, but it's um, up to Glyn to introduce everyone. So um, Glyn, you have the floor. Right. Many, many thanks, Stefan. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us for this roundtable. Uh, before I ask each of our panel members to tell us a little bit about themselves, I'll just give a very brief bit of background on myself. I run, as Stefan says, I run a business called Retail Insider, which is currently it's a website of opinions and insights on the retail sector. But we have a particular focus on technology and digital developments. We also produce various reports and host events. And it's also it's a pleasure to sometimes be invited to chair roundtables such as this one. I'm certainly hoping the next 45 minutes or so will be particularly interesting because, you know, as a, as a journalist in, uh, in retail and, and technology, there's no doubt marketplaces are one of the most exciting areas of the retail sector right now. Whether that be the case of you're hosting your own marketplace or you're selling on many of the new platforms that have sprung up over recent years. That during the established figures, you know, the likes of we know, we know, we know all the big ones, the Amazons and the Ebays. Um, clearly there's been a massive amount of activity in this, in this area. Uh, so hopefully we're going to explore some interesting areas. Um, to talk about this, we've got a great panel. I'll now ask each of our experts to briefly introduce themselves in absolutely no particular order. Uh, Raul, do you want to kick things off? Yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, thanks, Glenn. Uh, thanks uh, also for PIM vendors uh, for inviting us. Uh, my name is uh, Raul Stratov. Uh, I'm commercially uh, responsible within Katana PIM. Uh, what Katana PIM is a solution for brands, wholesalers, and retailers uh, that sell on uh, multiple online channels. So that means going from your website to maybe a B2B portal, uh, but also especially uh, on different online marketplaces. Uh, and basically what we try to do is make sure it's uh, easier uh, to manage all your product information for those different channels in one solution. So that means multilingual, but it also means... Uh, addressing all those different uh, required attributes uh, that uh, that the end channels uh, determine you have to fill in. Great. Thank you, Raoul. If everybody's watching the same screen as me, then I'm going to go diagonally across the page and I'm going to go down to you, Max. All right. Thank you. Uh, well, my name is uh, Max. Um, I'm uh, with Connecting the Dots. And Connecting the Dots uh, is uh, also a PIM vendor. Uh, and yeah, we specialize uh, in uh, PIM solutions for uh, retailers uh, and uh, wholesale, uh, and of course also brand owners. And um, when I'm saying specializing, yeah, we also uh, try to capture uh, well the more uh, challenging uh, PIM uh, scenarios for our customers. So uh, all our customers basically have one thing in common. You know, if there's a basic uh, challenge in the field of product information, uh, well, there's quite a chance that we're able to help. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Max. And moving left, Rupert, can you take a brief in intro? 
Um, yeah, thanks, Glenn. Um, I'm Rupert Firmstone. I'm responsible for Nova Mind um, in a few different territories, including the UK. Um, I've got about 15 years' experience with technology relating to content production and product data. Um, my passions are customer experience, audience engagement, and hyper personalized uh, customer journeys. Um, Nova Mind has four products. Uh, we have um, IPIM, which is for managing product information. iShop is an e-commerce platform. Uh, iMarket is a, a, a global middleware for integrating with marketplaces. Um, and we also have a customer service solution called iAgent. So uniquely, we are able to cover the whole customer journey. Um, and we are focused on mid-market um, to enterprise. Thank you, Rupert. And final member of the panel, Jerome. Yes, so great to be here. Uh, thanks, Glenn. Uh, my name is Jeroen. Um, I'm responsible for Miracle's business in the Benelux region, um, uh, which means that on a daily basis, I'm in touch with business leaders, digital leaders, to talk about uh, marketplace strategy, and then specifically on how to become a marketplace operator and create your own marketplace. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm certainly hoping with, um, with that, broad mix of expertise we're going to be able to cover off most of the areas within um within the marketplace uh area um uh, basically we've got some specific topics that i'm hoping we're going to cover off but we could easily be diverted we're basically going to look at a brief outline of the market um uh, and focus on selling on marketplaces and then move on to operating your own marketplace and then a brief look at the hybrid approach which i guess involves those um organizations which run their own marketplace but they also sell their own products on other third-party marketplaces and then finally we will wrap up with just taking a look at what our panel sees in terms of the future developments of the marketplace model um i'll basically be throwing a variety of questions at them but we'd obviously like to hear um what you've got out there in terms of your own questions and i think as stefan put in the panel if you type them in into the comment box then I will hopefully be able to bring those into the conversation as we go along. So hopefully we'll cover off quite a few of your questions uh, in the course of the next uh, 40 odd minutes. But sort of moving straight in there, just taking a look at the market as a whole. Uh, first up, let's just take a look in terms of why are organisations pursuing marketplace strategies? And, and I know Rupert is always very swiftly out of the blocks. Rupert, do you just want to get the ball rolling in terms of, you know, what, why are companies looking at marketplaces at the moment? Oh dear, gosh, it's me first. Okay, so I think with marketplaces, it's very easy to multiply um, your audience um, in, in a cost-effective manner. I think I see a marketplace almost as a, a product discovery hub. So if I need something random, um, I don't know, a, a nuclear-powered lawnmower with cyclone technology, um, I type it into Google, if such a product exists, I'm going to find it very quickly. So for end consumers, it's really good. Um, for people that are looking to sell stuff, organizations, it's, as I said, it's you can multiply your audiences. You can start quite quickly and without um, a huge amount of cost. Um, and I think also that with, with most organizations selling on marketplaces now, I think there's a risk. If you don't have a presence on marketplaces, you're going to lose a chunk of that business to your competitors. Um, in addition to that, it's a, obviously a shortcut to internationalization. Um, so I think from my side, they're, they're just a few of the benefits um, of, of organizations pursuing a marketplace strategy. Ral, have you got uh, anything you'd add in terms of, I guess that's a list of advantages Rupert's putting forward there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I think uh, it's the the missing out. So I think it's it's tougher and tougher to uh, to get traffic to your own web shop. So if you're a brand or a retailer, it's so tough to get just the traffic to your web shop because what you see now is that there are more searches being done on the marketplaces for a product than actually on the search engines. So uh, right now people are not going to Google to search for products; they're going to the Amazons, the Ebays, and the other big ones. So it's very tough to gain traffic to your own web to your own web shop. That's uh, that's one of the biggest reasons why you want to be active there. And then you see directly the the end result. Uh, what Google is doing uh, is becoming a marketplace by themselves. And also what you see with all the social selling, uh, chat selling, and everything uh, popping up. So 
it's just uh, the future of e-commerce is, uh, is is moving harder and harder towards uh, being uh, focused on marketplaces. Mm. Mm-hmm. Great, thank, thanks, Rob. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll ask you the same, obviously, Max. But I'm just wondering whether you can also add it, add on to that. Um, whether whether there are specific types of businesses or products that work well on marketplaces, and maybe some that it might not necessarily be suitable. I'll bring I'll bring that I'll bring the other guys in on that one as well. But uh, what's your your view on that, Max? Huh. Well. Uh... I think you know it, it very much uh, uh, depends uh, on the type of product you're selling. I mean, obviously, uh, yeah, when it comes to consumer goods, uh, well, I think um, well, there you see definitely a materialization uh, on uh, well the marketplaces available uh, when it comes to basically B two C. But if you're, for example, in B two B, hey, I think there's uh, especially also for marketplaces themselves. Uh, well, lots of, uh, you know, grounds uh, to conquer uh, where you're in that specific uh, field. So, um... thanks, Max. Jeroen, do you have any, any, um, your own views in terms of, in terms of what's the, uh, what's the sort of attraction, I guess, at the moment? And is it, it's not just a fear of missing out that we're looking at here. The attraction of marketplaces, you mean in general? Yeah, yes. Yeah. 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 Why, why would why would uh, an organization, a retailer or uh, a manufacturer choose to uh, choose to use the marketplace? Yeah. And then and, uh, I'll, I'll come in from the angle of, of uh, building your own marketplace. Right. I mean, yeah. why why do we have people that come and come to us saying hey, we, want, we want to build an own marketplace? And oftentimes it's, it's because they they see that the expectations of the consumers are changing. Right? They, they're much higher in terms of uh, look, uh, the, 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 the assortment that they are expecting. Uh, they don't want to be out of stock. They want it uh, directly, and they want it at a competitive price, right? So to meet up to that expectation, uh, you need to be able to scale your assortment quickly and be agile and, and then jump into trends. And if you take a traditional model where you have to go back into the whole uh, uh, value chain and go back to uh, uh, fabrication or change your uh, uh, supply chain, that that's, you're not agile. You're not able to to uh, to react. Uh, swiftly so by just adding a third-party seller on your platform you can immediately uh, uh, create that bigger assortment so offer more but also sell more to get a bigger share wallet from your customer and uh, learn more because now you, you uh, you're able to get more data and more insights into your customers uh, needs and so those are the, the, the main things and then without the risks uh, and, and costs of, of, of all storing it and shipping it yourself. I think that makes sense. Uh, you, uh, I think uh, when you look at marketplaces, you know they offer also lots of um, opportunity. You know, for example, uh, for brand owners or also retailers to uh, do some experiments. For example, uh, to see uh, you know uh, how, for example, new product lines or. Uh, product groups, uh, you know, might perform uh, to your target audiences. Uh, you can use uh, marketplaces for that. Uh, you you can, for example, say, hey, uh, I want to conquer new markets. For example, if you're now, uh, well, primarily active in the Benelux and you want to see, you know, how your products, uh, you know, might be able to sell, for example, in Germany. Yeah, uh, hey, th- those are strategies, uh, you know, um, can be very... Um, handy uh, when you're uh, looking at marketplaces. Speaking of which, you know, last but not least, I think uh, to be successful uh, on a marketplace, uh, you need to act uh, by uh, having a strategy. So, uh, for example, yeah, set yourself a goal and it uh, might well be, hey, uh, selling, uh, for example, your overstock, uh, trying to conquer new markets, uh, maybe looking uh, at stuff like uh, testing out uh, new uh, product categories uh, for your brand. I think, uh, yeah, that really uh, works on marketplaces. If you don't have a strategy and just like, uh, well, uh, publish uh, your products uh, whatsoever on every marketplace, I think it's getting more difficult because then, uh, you know, you're up uh, in a competition with lots of other sellers. And uh, you can basically only be successful. You know, it's harder to be successful, and you're mainly then also having a competition with other sellers on price. So mm-hmm. my advice would be, you know, work with a strategy when you uh, start approaching marketplaces. Yeah, thanks, Max. I was going to say you mentioned some of the some of the metrics for success. I guess you know, in terms of being able to use it as a, as a trial into new markets. I was just wondering what 
what success are we seeing on there? And is it the case of if we looked at that from a volumes point of view, then as more organisations go on, that success level gets gets not uh, gets slightly reduced down. Is that is that what we're seeing now? Because it's certainly a lot of activity, isn't there? I don't, Raoul, you, what, what do you think? That the levels of success or what you can achieve has it become very very competitive and more more difficult to achieve high volumes on there? Uh, yeah, definitely, because you, you're, uh, the, the level of competition is, is uh, a lot higher. So uh, mm. a lot of times you're, you're competing against four, five, six different retailers or even maybe the brand or the marketplace itself that's active as a seller, uh, uh, basically for the same product. So yeah. you're just looking at a, at, a, at, a, at a phone, for instance. It could be that for the same phone, you're competing on one platform with six, seven other sellers. Uh, so then uh, the, the small things, uh, they will determine if you're going to be successful. So that could be uh, next day delivery uh, with your order until 12 o'clock in, in the evening. Uh, it could be uh, no shipping costs. It could be your return policy. So this small, like the, the extra stuff now, that's that's making the difference, I think, on, uh, on marketplaces. It's not just getting only your products there. It's not only just price driven. Uh, it, it goes also for the expectation, what the client is is, is willing uh, or is wanting to accept, uh, just based on uh, how quick can I get my product, uh, what is return policy, stuff like that. Jerome, are you, have, you, have you found that in terms of what organizations are doing on your platform? They're, they're doing that. Raoul's just said, you know, they're having to offer more than just the cheapest price. There's these other, these other attractive factors. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, first of all, I think, again, looking from an operator point of view, uh, sometimes we have companies that say, hey, we have our own products, right? And we want to, yes, we want to uh, increase our assortment, uh, but we don't want to have the same, we don't have want to, we don't want to have sellers that are offering the same uh, products that we do. Uh, however, we say, uh, go for it, right? Enable competition. Mm -hmm. Because what we see is that when competition is enabled and you get all the advantages like Raul just mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, it will be more attractive for your, for your customers, right? And it will accelerate your growth. So we, we suggest enable that competition and then make sure as a seller on that platform that you stand out by by some of the examples that Lowell just gave right and and, and leave those fears of cannibalization um, and because it will the marketplace will will thrive right and you will get that that flywheel effect uh, once you have more offers there and that are competitive. now I've got, I've got probably the most difficult question i'm willing to, to to accept a response from absolutely any of you is is any examples of organizations that you would regard as having a, a good uh, marketplace strategy. So it was a tough one because this is where you name names. If if, if it's not going to work, then then we'll, we'll skip over it. I'm just wondering whether there I'm, are. Uh, I, there I'm are happy to. Like. I'm happy to throw some some things in here. So yeah. um, I think Mele, um, who's traditionally quite an old fashioned company, mm. has got a really good marketplace strategy. Um, I, th I think if you look at Amazon, they've got an elegant storefront, engaging content, really good branding social media integration you can jump to different products different accessories they've got a built-in product finder using artificial intelligence so i think it really is outstanding the way they've done that what's interesting is that contrasting to that if you look at dyson that's pretty much a direct competitor they seem to have a love-hate relationship with marketplaces so if i search for dyson on the Amazon um, marketplace, for example, I get Bosch come up at the beginning. So I think they're two examples that stand out um, for me as, as quite interesting. There's no, also the niche all... ones as well. There's some niche marketplaces which are coming up, the small ones. Um, I think there's one in the UK, ethical.market, which is selling ethical products. So I think that's a good example of smaller marketplaces, which I think are the future. Um, allowing niche small vendors to send, sell products in a very specific niche and vertical. Yeah, I, ca I came across a charity one very recently as well. It's just for charity um, retailers, I guess, to uh, to put their uh, their products on there as well. Uh, is any anybody else before we move on to the next block? Anybody else got any names in terms of good examples? Well, I think in, in terms of uh, also results, right? I think if you if you look at, for example, uh, Kumra Electronics. One of the first uh, uh, electronic uh, companies that went that opened a marketplace, Germany, and then then beyond. Um, they, their CEO told them that have told us that they they it, it took them 100 years to get to 800,000 products, right? In terms of offering, 
And then when they opened the marketplace, it took them one year to increase that to 4 million. Right, so that's that's amazing growth uh, uh, when it comes to marketplace. So I mean, I'm not talking so much about the user experience, which is which is good, mm. but that effect of adding those, I think for them, 200 sellers and increase that offering by by such an extent is, uh, is quite remarkable. I think we, we just move on to the, the the second block, which is selling on marketplace. Because I was going to ask you in terms of the pitfalls and challenges the risks of going on the marketplace. But if we look at that from, from the perspective of selling on marketplaces, um, I guess we, we, we've got things like the fact you might well be managing multiple marketplace connections in parallel. I mean, and Amazon, for instance, we could take Amazon and you might well be selling on the Dutch site, the UK site, the German site with the languages and the currencies, etc. Uh, and then some specific requirements from, from some of the niche um, platforms. You know, in terms of that clearly is a big challenge. I guess, you know, what's the, what is the approach to, to overcome some of those, uh, some of those challenges? Um, Raul, you, if somebody nods, that's always a good indication for me that they're okay to step in. <laughs> I, 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 I always nod, so please don't, right. don't but I happy, I happily do. Do you, do you, want, do you want to start? Yeah, some of that, yeah, I guess sure. we're looking at it from, from a, a challenger's perspective. If you're yeah, going to be sure. selling on, as a retailer, for instance, selling yes. on a marketplace. Yeah, so I think, uh, uh, there are two things that are uh, very important. I think your your IT infrastructure uh, that's drastically changed uh, for e-commerce the last couple of years with the, the come ups of uh, of marketplaces. So um, right now is making sure your IT is is ready to attack multiple marketplaces. So you have to set up like a scalable scalable solution where, of course, now we're talking to our own product here. Uh, of course, you have to have a PIM. So you have to have a centralized solution for all your product data. Right, so for all those marketplaces, it has to be multilingual. You have to address multiple attributes uh, within your PIM for those different marketplaces. Uh, but then also, you don't want to build that connection from your PIM and your ERP to every different marketplace because then you have to uh, you have to make the connections for every marketplace and you have to uphold them at the same time. So ideally, you want to use like marketplace integrators. So I'm very big on that part. Is use a marketplace integrator where you have one connection to to the integrator. It's like a middleware. And they have all the connections to all those marketplaces. So then it's just a, a plug and play solution. So you have your PIM set up, you have your ERP and your WMS system. You use your marketplace integrator and then you have your Amazon Co UK, your Amazon NL, you have your lo uh, local player. And then you say, now I want to sell in Scandinavia or in the US. You just plug and play within the integrator and the rest of your infrastructure, your IT infrastructure stays the same. So you become way more scalable at that, uh, at that moment. Is that Rupert, are you, um, you uh, yeah, so in terms of that, that type of approach then? is Because these things always sound relatively straightforward, I guess, that, you know, some complexity in that, isn't there? Um, yes, I think one of, the, one of the major points is that people don't appreciate how important product data is to the shopping experience. Um, and it isn't a small task mm. getting that product data in order to create that experience. Um, the other point is to look at when you shouldn't sell on marketplaces so if you if you're selling through a channel for example um to retailers and then you go direct on marketplaces that 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 can destroy your business and i think there's other situations that that i think is a pitfall where you've got a prestigious brand like a luxury brand that needs a really engaging experience through the sales process I think some of those don't work well on marketplaces. And I'm going to throw the example of Burberry in there. I'm going to guess they're not on a marketplace. Probably find out now that they've got an amazing marketplace strategy. But I think <laughs> products like that, I think, don't work so well on a marketplace and it cheapens the brand. Okay. Yeah, Max, do you want to add into, in, in, into that one? Oh, yeah. Uh, obviously, uh, there's... Uh, you know multiple points of attention uh when uh, when when you want to uh, go to marketplace in a serious way of course just like uh Raul said yeah uh, you have to make sure uh, that your ecosystem and your it is ready for it um and also think then uh, uh, that you have uh, basically always you work with two types of uh, feeds of course uh, you have your content feeds uh, which is basically uh, your product data itself uh, so it's your imagery, uh, it's your specifications of a product. And yeah, uh, you can make a difference um, in that. 
of mm. course, uh, there are marketplaces, uh, you know, who rate you for uh, better content, etc. And a PIM can be helpful. But there's also, of course, your offer feed. And it's definitely of help. Uh, you know, if you have one system um, which uh, can provide uh, both the offer feed and uh, the content feed, uh, because it means that as an organization, you can work for basically one uh, tool uh, in your ecosystem directly to, um, well, the different marketplaces. And of course, uh, yeah, uh, it's best to use, uh, for example, middleware uh, in it uh, to make sure you don't need cartridges for each and every uh, different marketplace. So yeah, that's helpful. But then, uh, as mentioned earlier, I think there's also uh, some thinking um, necessary uh, before uh, going big time uh, to marketplaces. And that's, well, uh, ask yourself a question, what do you want to achieve? Uh, and so come up with a strategy. Uh, I, well, I, I brought some at the table already. Uh, but you, for example, you can also uh, look at uh, being different. Uh, um, I know a few uh, of our customers who are very successful um, in uh, selling products on marketplaces. And what they all try to do in their own way is uh, making sure that they create, create a unique sale. For example, uh, creating a specific bundle uh, uh, that isn't uh, boosted by any other uh, seller yet, uh, which gives them the advantage uh, on specific marketplaces. So. I think that's probably the best advice I can give uh, without the obvious stuff as making sure the IT is ready. Uh, you know, come up with a strategy and try to, uh, yeah, get some creativity in there as well uh, so that you're able to create a unique offer. I can, thank you, Max. I can only assume that the marketplace organizations are constantly changing their fields, the data fields in relation to the product. Is that, I assume that's just something the PIM providers have to deal with constantly, and that's one of the reasons that you choose to use them. Is that am I am I correct in in that? And does that happen really frequently? Because I guess there's lots of changes in terms of the requirements. Is that Raoul? Do you want to? Uh... Yeah, maybe maybe Jeroen can attest to that uh, from the uh, from from the platform side of things. But I yeah. think the the big challenge for the different uh, sellers on the marketplaces is, is the, the ever changing. Uh, requirements uh, and optional attributes that the the, that mm. the channels are asking so um, because every channel basically determines their own rules so and you just have to apply by those rules right so you sell on their platform and those are those are the biggest uh, biggest challenges I think for sellers uh, in general is to comply for all those mm. those changes as well because sometimes you you get a change and your product isn't listed anymore in a certain category because you're missing an attribute uh, right overnight yeah. so that's uh, and also, I guess, from a marketplace perspective, if they've got some other more interesting data points, then it's potentially going to make the product more attractive on that marketplace. Is that, Jerome, is that, is, is that right? It's a point of differentiation, isn't it, if they've got different data points? Yeah, no, for sure. I think, uh, and also the rules, it, 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 it's true. Right? Uh, the operator decides whether your product will be uh, published, yes or no. Right? So I think there is the challenge in, in, in first of all, making sure you fetch all the product files and, and, and map the interface and transform the format. Right? And then there's the next step of uh, a deduplication, uh, uh, validation, but also the enrichment, like, like you mentioned before, uh, before it goes live. Yeah. Mm. So the, other, the other area of complexity I, I could see is, especially if you're operating on multiple marketplaces, and obviously as a, as a retailer, you're going to be selling through your own channel as well, just handling the, the inventory availability and clearly your own price changes as well. I mean, is that, how do, how's that uh, dealt with? Ru Rupert, is that uh, what happens in, in, in Overmind from that perspective? I think those whole interfaces to marketplace, the connections to multiple marketplaces is incredibly complex and it, it's a changing beast. So we literally have people uh, sitting in an office monitoring the interfaces to make sure that our customers solutions continue to work uh, and sometimes you don't get any notice that those those interfaces are going to change um, but yes in terms of the, the stock and the price changes it's similar to PIM mm. as soon as you in, in, introduce new marketplace channels you've multiplied the challenges so with our solution um, we're dealing with the whole flow 
and also the fulfillment. So what you don't want to have is a situation where someone orders something on, say, eBay and has actually been sold on another channel and you're yeah. out of stock. So that, that creates a dreadful user experience. So tying the whole thing up um, across multiple um, marketplaces um, and dealing with the fulfillment is, is I'm going to use the word nightmare. In terms of scaling, it, it's very challenging. You can't do it without a proper solution. And even for vendors of such solutions, it's actually quite challenging behind the scenes. Yeah, I was going to, I was going to say, you know, from historically, from a retailer's perspective, just getting a single view of stock to be in place across their physical stores and their online is, is a tough one. And then you throw in multiple marketplaces, then, you know, having a synchronized stock across those platforms sounds sounds like a tough one. I mean, is, is it, how, how is it? I mean, clearly you've said it's very difficult. Do they have to have, they've got to have some internal expertise up there before they, before they then feed into the, the, the PIM and, and the marketplaces? Um, so um, our system, um, Novamind iMarket, is effectively a middleware that ties everything together um, okay. and makes sure that if someone orders something off Amazon and there was only one in stock mm -hmm. and then someone two minutes later orders that product off eBay, it makes sure that two items aren't sold when there's only one in stock. So, yeah, it, it's it's difficult stuff behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, I think, I, yeah, I think just to, to, to log into that, I think that's that's why you need the, the proper tools that's why that whole e-commerce landscape is changing so much because it's not something you build yourself it's not something you monitor from your yeah. erp you need to have like a middleware solution so that could be multiple things but same goes for your pim right for managing your product information if you want to sell on different marketplaces you have to have the right tooling so you have to invest in the right right yeah. solutions uh, in your whole it landscape uh, to be successful because you don't want to uh, uh, let's say have like an out of stock option and then you get a strike from one of the marketplaces and then mm. three strikes and you're not able to mm. uh, to sell anymore. So then you're out. So that's uh, the, the right tooling is the most important thing. Uh, Thank you, Rob. Just just finally on this on this little uh, block, uh, Max, are you are you finding retailers they they recognise this complexity when they when they begin or, or they're investigating selling on marketplaces? Are they aware of the complexity or is that is that something that takes them a little bit by surprise? I think we lost him. I think we've lost. Uh, well, yeah, lost sure. Him. Actually, maybe. Um, of course, when you're. I can, I can see and hear you all. Uh, so, yeah, uh, when I look at uh, retailer uh, examples, um, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, they first off, again, make sure uh, that the IT infrastructure is ready for it. And especially when it comes to PIM, yeah, they want to make sure uh, that uh, they also uh, have some uh, dashboarding, for example, available uh, to see uh, how their products are performing on specific marketplaces. And those dashboards uh, also provide in PIM, for example, grades, uh, which uh, provides insights from, hey, uh, when I'm looking, for example, at my product content of this this specific uh, product, um, hey, uh, I'm doing very well, for example, on Amazon, so I get a great A for it. But for example, the same product data uh, doesn't score an A, but uh, a B grade uh, in, uh, for example, uh, yeah, another marketplace is real.de. So uh, they very much use the PIM uh, system, uh, you know, for content optimization specifically, also for uh, marketplaces and uh, they use this sort of specific tooling for it uh, so uh, uh, insights and reports uh, and tips uh, how to improve uh, your product data yeah uh, i also see this question uh coming up uh, how to handle for example uh, different uh, tax uh, rates mm. well i think it's very much uh then depends on the type of pims existing or ecosystem hey, if the it infrastructure that you're using um I think in most PIM systems, uh, stuff like pricing, taxing, uh, etc., is not supported. Uh, but uh, I think if I look at real solutions, uh, what I know a bit of, I'm looking uh, at our solution, uh, uh, connecting the dots uh, PIM. Yeah, we definitely also provide, um, yeah, modules uh, for uh, price optimization, uh, which also includes uh, tax uh, rulings, which basically is that you can set formulas. Uh, you know, to uh, 
um, yeah, calculate uh, prices uh, near real time. So you can also, for example, alter uh, your pricing strategies, uh, you know, near real time uh, for specific markets and specific marketplaces, including, of course, also tax regulations uh, for specific okay. markets. Right. Lovely. Great. Th thank you, Max. Uh, just moving on to which is where Jerome is going to be great at Miracle, this next uh, next block, in terms of operating a marketplace. Now, I, I certainly know from within the UK, earlier in the week, we almost had a flurry of, of news stories of every large retailer out there considering setting up their own marketplace. Some of them did, and I think some of them just probably like to say they were going to do it, but there's certainly been a lot of activity. So, yeah. Jerome, why, why, why should you do it? And I guess... There are clearly there are organisations which it's it's definitely a good move, and others maybe not so good. So what would be what would be the decisions you should say you, you'd you'd recommend that they they uh, they consider? Yeah, no, good point. So um, yeah, we got, we got a lot of companies that, that are exploring. Right? I mean, we we all know that that uh, specifically, but I think within the, within this group that e-commerce is obviously that there's the digital revolution and so on and so on. We see e-commerce going up and to the right. But then that also brings a lot of uh, uh, challenges, right? So one there is that what I discussed in the beginning, those changing expectations. So people want anything, anywhere, anytime. So how do you deal with that? Um, if you want to deal with that properly, then it's probably going to be have an impact on your margins, right? If you if you keep doing what you do, which means that you are going to produce more, or you're going to buy more, uh, have more stock, uh, and more complexity and risks. Uh, and investments also in your logistics, which has an impact on your margins. But that's two. So one is the expectations, one, two, the margins, and then three, there's competition, right? So everybody is going online. So your typical competitors will be online, but then there are also, obviously, what we, dis what we have been discussing, the Amazons and the Apollo.coms in the Netherlands, for example, uh, that, will take, that are taking a piece of the pie. And on the other side, digital natives, the companies that are born online and also focusing on their e-commerce and taking a piece of the pie as well. So those are typically the three main drivers for companies exploring the opportunity of creating their own marketplace. The uh, you know one of one of the one of the decisions, and I know Amazon, I guess, has, has set the um, precedent for it in terms of as a, as a um, as long as actually the, the the options they provide, such as whether whether they hold the stock, whether it's third party vendors deliver or de handle all the fulfillment. I guess that's a, that's the level of, of, of complexity you could go into if you're offering all of those alternatives, isn't it? Is that, is it a case of, you know, you could offer the whole lot or you could just offer one and let them, let the, the, the let the retailer or whatever, or the, the, the brand owner do all the fulfillment. I guess that's a big consideration, isn't it? It is. And, yes. and, and, a, level of, and a level of complexity in, in, in the product information management aspect. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the beauty of a marketplace is that you're able to outsource a lot of the e typical e-commerce activities, right? So, yeah. which makes you more scalable. So if you're able to outsource the logistics, for example, right, this will help you to scale uh, faster and, 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 uh, and be more agile. That being said, we have uh, companies and clients that choose to still offer uh, the fulfillment, for example. Why do they do it? It's not... It's, it's not it's typically an EBIT neutral uh, activity, right? So it's not so much to make more money. It, yeah. it, it's more to become more sticky, right? Uh, create a more sticky relationship with these, with these sellers on their marketplace, right? With, with more marketplace coming sure. uh, all the time. You also, you, you, basically when you, when you start a marketplace, you have two types of customers. You have your actual customers that you're selling into, but also the sellers, the third party sellers on your marketplace, you try to make sure that they uh, are committed to your marketplace as well. So uh, providing fulfillment, for example, could help you to bring uh, uh, better sellers on board. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Raoul, have you, yeah. you know, from a pitfalls perspective, I guess, the, related to product information, are there any examples you might be able to give in terms of, uh, in terms of where there's uh, mistakes potentially made from, um, from organizations that have, that have adopted uh, marketplaces? Um. Well, uh, just looking at the, the returns number also for marketplace well, in the total. So I, I missed I missed a little bit of the beginning of your question, uh, Glenn, because you, you your connection hampered a little bit. But I hope I have a good understanding of what you try to ask. 
Um, but uh, I think uh, getting the right uh, getting the right content, I think, is is key. Uh, making sure your attributes, your 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 pictures, your descriptions are uh, are uh, all of a good level, because uh, still about twenty seven percent of all returns. Uh, are because of the content is not yeah. correct in the uh, correctly uh, resolved on the different on the different channels so it can go for your own web shop also on the marketplace so that's that's one of the big parts um, and also now but I also had a question for uh, for you now I asked it back to start with a marketplace because what you see also with the big the big retailers is they're using uh, their platform and they're using sellers to basically fill their empty stock so uh, to make sure all this, the, the whole size line, uh, the whole size line is, is filled with all the sizes for the shoes, uh, for instance. So they just open it up to a poor long tail, but also for size filling. Do you also see that a lot or? Yes, yes, that's what we see, right? So we see oftentimes that it's, it's, it's range extension, uh, which is uh, oftentimes a driver in terms of the assortment being more wide, but also deeper. Yep. Um, and then creating the the endless aisles as they as they call it, uh, especially as you if you combine it with only channels. Actually, can I can I say at this stage that Raoul's highlighted the fact my pronunciation of your name, Jerome, is absolutely horrific. So I do apologise at this stage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we, got, we have a question here from Jonah Bergdorfer. That's another another example of my great pronunciation. Um, for a, uh, Max, for a typical PIM project, if such a thing exists, that is. How much custom development would be required for, for, for if you're going to go into um, dealing with marketplaces? I know that's probably quite a big question, isn't it? But I'm just wondering you know, what what levels of, of customization would, would a, an organization be looking to uh, to uh, have to undertake? Yeah, it would be helpful, Glenn, if you can, uh, again, repeat the question because uh, yeah. my connection is hampering or yours. Okay, or yeah. Um, for for a, a typical PIM project, um, how much customization would be required with it within a marketplace context? Oh, it depends. I think if you uh, want to start uh, selling on marketplaces, well, um, I don't think uh, you have to make um, big changes. However, it's wise, uh, you know, to work with a PIM system who, f who facilitates uh, selling. Uh, on different marketplaces. Uh, so at least uh, you, uh, you need to have connections uh, to the marketplaces uh, provided uh, by the PIM uh, system. Um, yeah, it's helpful to have specific tooling uh, in the PIM system uh, to uh, make sure uh, that you can achieve your goals, for example, uh, by improving uh, the product data. Uh, uh, so this is basically uh, uh, the, the content feed that you are providing uh, to a marketplace. And it can be very beneficial if that PIM system also provides you with the opportunity, for example, uh, uh, to uh, control and set uh, your price uh, strategy. Uh, that's I think we're losing Max. Yeah, really. I'm losing Max there. Actually, just while while Max recovers his broadband capability, Rupert, just on 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 um, slightly moving on from that one, uh, is there any complexity involved in managing your own product information as well as supplier provided information on a on a on a single platform of a marketplace? Is that an issue? Um, is there an added complexity in that? There can be, yes. So product information can be complex even when you've got a small number of products around the marketing use case because you want to get good marketing collateral related to that for different markets in different languages as soon as you expand the number of products i mean it could be tens of thousands it could be hundreds of thousands you're getting vast complexity there um, and i think some organizations don't appreciate that and don't appreciate the complexity of um of, of of pim solutions and what they do so um to a point you can manage that in excel in excel spreadsheet um and then typically we find organizations that are selling on multiple channels m multiple marketplaces multiple languages um it just explodes it's effectively a cumulative effect where you can't cope with that complexity without a solution 
So yes, the answer can be yeah. very complex. Yeah, yeah. Right. thank I think you. Ex especially now, but if I may add to that on uh, what Rupert is saying. So now what you're seeing a lot more also is is the more rich content that, uh, that, that the bigger marketplaces now are asking, the, the, the A plus content that Amazon's asking. So now the the the, the, the bigger channels uh, and I believe that the smaller marketplaces will follow as well. Like the extra rich content, uh, the more customized templates for uh, for uh, product pages, um, which are. Uh, will make it more and more complex. So mm. your e-commerce team will, in the near future, will have to grow to a, a number of people just to manage that part, just just working on the basic product data. So managing it for all the countries, but also work with the rich content, making sure your your image is in order. That, uh, well. And, and this, actually, this actually goes back to Melee. So looking at the Melee Amazon store, it's beautiful, rich con content, and that's taken a lot of work behind the scenes. And I think organizations are at a different level of maturity. So you're seeing Melee's direct competitors are at a very different stage in their life cycle and have got a lot of catching up to do. Okay, thank you. Thanks for Alan and Rupert. Yeah, I guess the ne next bit, we're just gonna canter briefly over the hybrid bit, which I guess adds, adds another level of complexity in terms of operating a marketplace, but also selling on third-party marketplaces. Uh, we've also got uh, various examples of organizations doing that. Um, Jerome, is that, um, why would you do that? I guess it just gives you more opportunity, doesn't it? Stickiness is one, and then obviously you're selling, you've got multiple multiple channels to sell your own mark, your own product down. Uh, is that, is that, does it, is it another level of complexity, but there are upsides to it, clearly? Yeah, I think, I think there was Zalando uh, who recently mentioned the, the, the connected retail race. Mm. So that is, it, 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 it's, uh, it's much more a mix, right, of what you do. I mean, you look at your first, uh, what we call 1P, which is your own, your own products. Right? You, you look at this. Then you look at some of the products that maybe are bulky or, or hard to ship, right? And you can drop ship this, for example. And then you can, you can extend that even further. And, and, and create a marketplace for those third party uh, sellers and extend your range. But at the same time, and I think we, we mentioned a couple of examples, uh, for example, at Leertjes.com in the Netherlands, you can also then, that wouldn't exclude the option of selling on a, uh, on a uh, marketplace as well. I, I avoided mentioning that Dutch name because I was too scared of pronouncing it really badly. Thank you for thank <laughs> me, you for <laughs> Max, are you you you're back? You're back with us. Yeah. Did did you have you anything to to add into that one? We're looking at the you know I guess the the, the, the model that Zalando may well have been at the uh, the forefront of the, the the hybrid and the complexity that yeah. uh, potentially entails. Yeah, definitely as complex. Complexity, for example, we have a customer uh, who's selling on marketplace itself, but also acts uh, as a marketplace. Uh, also uh, using Miracle, and that's uh, kleertjes.com. Well, uh, for our Dutch viewers, uh, it's probably known. Uh, but they, again, uh, they uh, yeah, definitely uh, made that part of their strategy uh, to, uh, you know, start, uh, you know, to act as a marketplace. And the whole reason uh, for doing that uh, for them, uh, you know, was uh, because they want to be market leader in the field, uh, you know, of kids and teens. Uh, clothing. So yeah, that makes sense uh, because you're not uh, only uh, selling your own uh, products, but you also uh, provide room for other sellers, uh, you know, to uh, sell, uh, well, clothing uh, as well. But yeah, it adds complexity because now um, hey, you also have the dynamics uh, that you have to welcome sellers. And um, of course, uh, you want to make sure that the products they are selling uh, you know, also meet your brand quality. So you have to uh, have regulations uh, in there uh, to make sure uh, uh, that you, uh, well, have um, a feeling of the uh, of the type of products uh, which are sold on your platform. So you want, for example, to set categories. Uh, you want uh, also, uh, you know, only trusted vendors uh, who are able to sell uh, on your platform uh, because it's your brand's uh, name which is at stake. Uh, and uh, yeah, you also want to co uh, control the specific products uh, which are offered. And yeah, if you really uh, want to scale up, you know, it's uh, there's no way uh, 
uh, of monitoring each and every product which uh, is brought online by one of your sellers, uh, you know, by uh, an employee. So you have to have some automation for that, uh, you know, filter. Uh, um, as you can and say to make sure that the bulk of the product data you know is filtered by automatic ruling but uh, well say uh, products uh, which are flagged heard by individuals uh, by your employees to make sure uh, that uh, you know those products uh, are in line uh, you know with uh, your own brand identity and you know doesn't harm your brand's identity so those, uh, that's one of the aspects of course because you can also look, uh, for example, at other stuff like, hey, uh, what do you have to um, do, for example, in your processes and your IT? Because now you have a customer who buys five products and it's three products uh, in that basket, you know, that uh, uh, you're selling yourself and, you know, are from your own warehouse. But then two of those products, you know, are from two different sellers and then uh, those goods are delivered. And, uh, you know, one of those products, um, you know, a customer wants to return it so what's your process uh, for that that's all sorts of uh, uh, well different processes and scenarios you have to tackle first and you have i think max has faded yeah, yeah, faded out. I tell you what, before we come on to the last bit where I'm going to ask each of you, uh, hopefully, we'll get Max back, ask each of you how you think the, the, the future development of the marketplace will be. Any, any, the, before we touch on that, I just got the question, which I'm sure you can all see, Janet Shah's question. When, when B2B client, this is, this is me exactly reading, uh, the question. When B2B client who have B2B, who has B2B commerce site should move to a marketplace model. Yeah, yeah. If I may step in, I think when you have the when you have the traffic uh, to get to your site, that could be a good indicator uh, that you can go, that you can open it up for marketplace. But then, the, then my next question will be: Would you want to be a B two B marketplace, which is also becoming uh, more popular uh, within the the B two B world, or do you want to open up the, for direct to consumer? Um, so it's it's a good question, but it will it calls up. I think uh, another 20 questions uh, directly questions. back. Uh, it's maybe it's maybe a question to be brought in when when we split into different panels later. That might be a good one. But yeah, just yeah. I'm just aware of the time ticking by. Just the last bit, just in terms of looking into the future briefly. Uh, future developments of the marketplace. Um, do each of you have any particular view in terms of you could see the, this area of the, the industry going in this direction? A slight, slight look forward. Jerome, do you want to take that in terms of obviously you're as a, as a provider of the marketplaces? How, where do you see yeah. that one going? Yeah, I think one, one interesting trend that we've seen uh, uh, this year, actually, uh, compared to the years before, is we've seen that the, that the large marketplaces like Amazon have taken on, kept on growing, right? kept on uh, growing market share, for example, uh, in, in France, but now, uh, and in almost every country. But now for the first time, we see that the um, uh, humans, you know, the, the, the companies that were already there and losing market share are taking market share back. So this is this is sort of a trend, a break of the trend, right? Because they are creating their own marketplaces. So, and this is what we see: we see more and more marketplaces, but curated marketplaces. So not the wild, wild west where everything comes together, but where you add value uh, by creating a curated. A high quality uh, uh, marketplace, and I think this is what we see more and more. And to come back to the question of Janet, what we see is there's a enormous uh, growth within uh, B two B marketplaces. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of B two B companies that are exploring this because, in the end, the B two B buyer is also a consumer and has the same expectations and is looking for that B two C uh, experience in the B two B environment. So those are typical uh, uh, trends that we see. Great. Thank you, Jerome. Actually, on that rally, it sort of taps into what you said earlier in terms of that richness of the data, isn't it? That is the point of differentiation that that enhances your 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 uh, your, your marketplace and gives it that uh, that standout. Yeah. Is that yeah, anyway, sorry, that, not answering the question for you. Yeah. Where, where do you see 
see the future of the marketplace, Rob. Yeah, I, I, I see it maybe a little bit, uh, maybe blacker. I don't know if that's the right, uh, right way of translating it, uh, how it comes to my head. But how I see it is that uh, what, what will going to happen is, uh, is especially the bigger brands are, uh, are basically going to take full control back. Uh, so the smaller sellers, the, the, the smaller retailers are, uh, are going to dwindle down. Uh, and the bigger brands or the bigger wholesalers uh, next to them are going to take over. So it's going to be a lot of marketplaces. Uh, I do believe there's room for brand stores and everything else uh, in between, but uh, it will be a total different landscape with, uh, with way less, less players uh, involved. Mm. Yep. Max, if you say it quickly, maybe we can catch you before the, before the tech gives, it gives away on you. Oh. Maybe it's already given way. Yeah, jinxed it. I think it might have already given way. Rupert, <laughs> Rupert, you step in. You um, yeah, so, um, I think marketplaces are only going to increase uh, in, in all areas. So increased sales, I think increased number of marketplaces. As Jerome said, I think B2B are going to play catch up in terms of customer experience versus the B2C. And the um, and we're going to see it's a big increase in B two B marketplaces. Mm. I also think there's going to be an increase in the number of niche marketplaces um, that continue to appeal. I think I mentioned the ethical marketplace, and I think um, those types of marketplaces really appeal to the new generation of demographics. So, um, yeah, that's on the up. I think is the summary. Yeah. Okay. Great. Lovely, Rupert. Um, in the absence of Max, I would like to, with, with, with the clocks are up, run around to, to, um, to 4 p.m. in the UK. Uh, right, wait, I'd like to uh, just sort of thank the panel. Thank you, thank each of you for contributing. That's been terrific. Thank you very much. Um, great input. Um, hope it's been informative for everybody on the call. Um, hopefully it's answered some of your questions, but I know there's going to be a split off uh, shortly, which Stefan will, will highlight the details of that to you. I'd like to... Uh, Thank Pin Vendors for putting this event together. And on that note, I will um, say goodbye for my little little bit and uh, hand you back to uh, Stefan. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Glenn. Um, um, yeah, from my side as well, um, I want to thank all the, the panelists for taking their time and, uh, and sharing their vision on, on both um, the market and, and the future dynamics, the current market and the future dynamics. Um, and also, uh, Glenn, I want to thank you specifically for, uh, for moderating this, uh, this event. Um, as well, um, I think you did a splendid job uh, in uh, in managing all the technical difficulties as um, as well. Um, as you mentioned, uh, yes, we are moving towards the uh, the Q and A session. So, um, on for all the attendees on your left hand side, you see the stage, you see um, sessions, and you see the expo where every vendor has a booth. Uh, we'll now be moving to the um, the uh, the sessions where every speaker will uh, will be available for your questions and answers. So. Um, if you have any specific burning questions left uh, or you want some more detail on, on which uh, um, factors decide whether you should start your own marketplace um, or uh, how to efficiently manage a lot of channels and, and different marketplaces across Europe or across the globe even, um, you can now uh, head over to the sessions or maybe give the speakers uh, two or three minutes to, uh, to shift over and hop on over to uh, the sessions. Um, and if you ever have any questions on, on PIM and selecting a new PIM, um, definitely visit um, PIMVendors.com and um, give us a quick uh, review of the tools, the free tools that we offer, um, and uh, maybe even uh, fill in our quick scan that allows our algorithm to select the best fitting top five PIM solutions for you. Um, we have a full list of events uh, coming up later this, this month, um, um, so keep an eye out on our LinkedIn. Um, as well. And for everyone that dropped in later or might have missed a few minutes in the beginning or maybe even had to leave early, uh, we are also sharing a recording of the event with everyone that, um, that attended. So keep an eye out on your inbox as well. Um, that leads me to wrap up this uh, part of the, um, the event. Um, see you all in the sessions um, and, uh, or on the booth and see you all in a future Pin Vendors event. Have a nice evening.